entering that courthouse will be the last time he will be a free man if he is found guilty. If, however, he is found innocent, he will walk out of this glass okay. door, these glass doors, ending 40 years of speculation. Are you feeling nervous this morning? Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch and to the 40 year old murder mystery that captured a nation. With Tuesday's verdict in the trial of Chris Dawson turning the case of missing Sydney mum, Lynette Dawson, from Who Done It to He Did It. Murderer. Tell us where Lynn is. It was a decision that blew many a legal mind, with Lynette's husband, Chris Dawson, convicted of her 1982 murder without any physical evidence. There was no body, there was no weapon, uh, there was no forensic evidence, there was no direct evidence. But before finding Dawson guilty, Justice Ian Harrison painstakingly laid out his reasons and kept the hungry media guessing for five hours, so that when he finally delivered his verdict... Uh, you did murder Lynette Dawson. I find you guilty. The media were at fever pitch and they quickly descended on Dawson's family. While both his older and twin brothers left court in a cluster of elbows, cameras and curse words... Do you still believe your brother is innocent? Do you have any idea where Lynette may be? In all the confusion, Sky News reporter Gabriella Power mistook Dawson's twin brother Paul for the convicted killer. How do you feel about going to jail? Anything to say to Lynette's family? Are you going to help them find the body? Chris has a lot of interest in this. I'd like to hear from you. Oh, Paul, you idiot! That embarrassing gaffe went viral, but the Daily Mail leapt to the Sky reporter's defence and explained the mistake with a series of glossy Gabriella photos and this classic catch-all headline. Glamorous Sky News presenter who confused teacher's pet killer Chris Dawson with his twin, once danced with Prince Harry and has a surprise connection to Richard Wilkins and why she's going to be a star on TV. That was at the start of two days of blanket coverage, especially at News Corp, with the Australian dedicating six pages to the story and the Daily Telegraph going one better with seven, and both highlighting the role of the Australian's Headley Thomas and his teacher's pet podcast in bringing the killer to justice. But even with Dawson behind bars, the media just couldn't let the story go. Day one of what could be the rest of his life in prison. His possessions exchanged for a green tracksuit, some toiletries and a ration pack led to a cell with a steel toilet, kettle and sandwich maker. In fact, Dawson was processed just like any other prisoner. The only difference being he was put into an isolation wing for his own safety. Chris Dawson's lawyer revealed in court this morning that his client had received constant threats since being taken into custody despite being held in isolation in prison. By Thursday, the Dawson story was surely done. But wait... There was more. Detectives now believe that they know where Lynn's body may be. Good morning, Kylie. A major breakthrough. There's shocking new revelations in the Chris Dawson case. Detectives have revealed they know where the remains of his wife, Lynette, are, but there is a twist. A major breakthrough. Shocking revelations. And what's the twist? Police investigating the case believe her body is somewhere on the New South Wales central coast, but they say the area is far too big to search for her burial. Yes, that is the twist. Somewhere on the central coast, but no clues as to where. And unless Chris Dawson tells the police, we will almost certainly never know. Meanwhile, he maintains he is innocent and his lawyer says he will appeal the verdict. So, stay tuned. But now, to a nasty smear in The Australian. Teal's Bonanza. Allegra Spender Company's $280 million tax-free payday. That sounds like a bit of a rort, doesn't it? And reading the headline inside the paper, you might think the new independent MP is not just dodging her dues, she's also a bit of a hypocrite. Exclusive. Tax reform Teal's $280 million tax-free gain. In that, she seems to be saying one thing and doing another. So, what's the story? Well, according to the Australian's political reporter, Jess Malcolm... Wentworth Independent MP Allegra Spender is a corporate director of a private Australian company that did not pay tax on a $280 million payment it received in 2019, according to annual transparency reports published by the Australian Taxation Office. That is disgraceful, isn't it? 
Well, no, because as we discover in the next paragraph... The $280 million payment was a one-off dividend payment from related companies that had already been taxed at the full corporate rate of 30%. So, the $280 million was not tax-free at all, because the dividend was what is known as fully franked, and $84 million of tax had already been paid by other companies belonging to Spender. So, the MP was not dodging tax, but doing something entirely legal and commonplace that millions of Australians have been doing for years, since dividend imputation was introduced in 1987. Did the Australian know that? We'd hope so. Did it make it clear? No, it did not. And why not? Well, if it had, it would have been even harder to run the story, which is nothing but a cheap, misleading beat-up. There were more than 700 comments under the online article, some of which made that clear, but most attacked Spender. And our favourite? Would you believe the ABC isn't covering this story? Sure would. Well, now we have. And we asked the Australian to justify its tax-free claim, but it did not get back to us. Allegra Spender told us she found the article disappointing, but she will not complain to the Press Council. But now to a common household scourge that Seven Sunrise says may be damaging your brain. Malt has been causing problems right along the East Coast, but it's not just unsightly, it can also be a major health hazard. Yeah, what about this? It's prompted one Aussie woman to share her story. Uh, Amy Skilton developed Alzheimer's and forgot her own name after being exposed to black mould. Yes, you heard right. Mould under the carpet causing a debilitating and progressive brain disease with no known cure. But amazingly, as Koshi told us, this story had a happy ending. Thankfully, she has made a full recovery. And with Amy on sunrise to tell all, Natalie Barr was all ears. This is frightening, Amy. Tell us that moment when you couldn't remember your name. What do you remember around that period? Nat, that whole year was quite a blur, but, you know, it's supposed to be the easiest question on a test, right? And I was filling out a form for the RTA and the blank box remained blank, as did my mind. I, I literally couldn't remember my name. Wow. And if you think that deserves a follow-up question, you'd be right. And to Sunrise's credit, there was a local GP to answer it. How can mould cause memory loss. The issue is that the toxins produced by moulds that can be in your house, you don't even notice the moulds, but the toxins have an effect on the nervous system. Huh. And when it affects the brain, people like Amy run into problems. Amy Skilton is a naturopath, herbalist, nutritionist, Reiki master and life coach who runs a health and wellness website. She also describes herself as a certified mould testing technician. And her miraculous recovery from mould-induced dementia had popped up first on news.com.au. Hidden problem in Sydney home left perfectly healthy woman with dementia. That hidden problem being... A secret mould infestation in her Sydney home. Which led to Amy, then 37, to be diagnosed with... Type 3 Alzheimer's disease, also known as inhalational Alzheimer's. And as the article listed all the terrible health problems that mould can trigger, there was a handy link to Amy's naturopath business. Got a mould problem? You're in the right place where readers could click on a handy course to mould-proof your home and find out all you need to know about mould for one easy payment of $397. Two days after Amy's story appeared in News Corp Australia, it was given the red top treatment in Britain by sister paper The Sun. Fungus horror! My mouldy house gave me dementia at 37. It is alarming stuff. So, how worried should we be? Can mould really cause Alzheimer's disease? And at 37? We put that question to Dementia Australia, and its response was unequivocal. There is nothing in the recognised scientific literature which would validate black mould contributing to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Nor is type 3 Alzheimer's a recognised diagnosis. That statement coming from three of Australia's leading experts. Professor Henry Bradouty, co-director of the Centre for Healthy Brain Ageing. Professor Amy Brockman from the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. And Associate Professor Michael Woodward, director of aged care research at Austin Health. And what of the idea that Alzheimer's can be reversed? A claim made in all the stories. Well, that was dismissed by the experts as well. There is no recognised scientific evidence of degenerative dementias such as Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies being reversed or cured. 
Now, we're not saying mould does not cause health problems, but the alarming claim that it can trigger Alzheimer's is clearly rejected by key dementia experts. And that was a critical fact. Neither news.com.au, The Sun nor Sunrise bothered to mention. As for having type 3 Alzheimer's, it seems Amy Skilton diagnosed it herself, relying on the controversial American neurologist, Dale Bredesen, who identified this unrecognised subtype and his 2017 book promises to prevent and reverse the disease. Ms Skilton told MediaWatch that she was... Dedicated to raising awareness on this issue wherever and whenever I can and have been ever since I was well enough to speak about it. And you can read her full response on our website. Finally, to the many lies of Cassandra Sainsbury, who was rebranded Cocaine Cassie by the media in 2017 after she was arrested in Colombia with almost six kilos of the drug in her luggage. She spent three years in a Bogota prison, but last week made a triumphant return to South Australia with a new look and a new wife. And Seven and Nine, which have competed for her story since day one, were on the spot. Drug smuggler Cassie Sainsbury is back on home soil for the first time in five years. Nine reporter Jessie Burns is in Adelaide. Jessie, good morning. She was joined by her new wife and a camera crew. Never leave home without one. This time the accompanying camera crew being from Channel 7 Spotlight, which had paid for her and her wife's flights back home and were in the middle of two weeks filming. The Channel Live's Today team was quick to remind viewers that Cassie had already told all for 60 Minutes. And it's believed, Alex, that tell-all reporter, that documentary is set to air in the coming weeks, but everything you need to know about Cocaine Cassie can be seen on 60 Minutes in a brilliant 60 Minutes special. And Alex, boy, is it one to watch. It sure is, Jesse. You said it. But Seven assured us that it had the untold story of Cocaine Cassie and it had the promo to match. Revelations unable to be told until now. I feared for my life. A massive organised crime enterprise. The most explosive interview of the year. With the tell-all also getting pumped up on Seven's Sunrise. She's finally revealing each step of her foiled operation in the hope criminal masterminds will be brought to justice. I'm not lying. Now that really would be a TV first, because Cassie Sainsbury has a troubled relationship with the truth. There's a lot of porky pies going on here, isn't there? In a prison interview with 60 Minutes five years ago, she claimed she didn't know the full name of the drug lord she met in Colombia. What did he say his name was? Uh, Angela. Angela. I didn't get a last name. He was very, very vague on details. Only to reveal his full name three years later. So were you lying to me previously? I wouldn't say that I was lying, but I wasn't giving you everything. So which, which, yeah. version, which version is true? This latest version? It's a true version. Is it? Cassie has also changed her story on whether she's ever been a sex worker. When I first met her... I wasn't a prostitute. Cassie vehemently denied the claims. You weren't a prostitute? No. You never worked at Club 220? There was some work relating with Club 220, but it wasn't prostitution. That wasn't quite true, was it? No. Cassie herself admits that she lied from the moment of her arrest. The story kept changing so much, even she seemed to have trouble keeping track of the current version. So what makes this latest interview so explosive? And perhaps more importantly, why should we believe that this time it is the truth? Rolls of cocaine. Finally you've admitted it. It was a big lie. You now realise what it was, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. What was it? It was drugs, cocaine. That was the biggest surprise. And really, no surprise at all. Cassie finally admitted what was obvious from the start. She knew she was carrying drugs, and she'd been doing so for quite some time on local deliveries around Sydney. Cassandra has never publicly revealed this information. It details how she and other girls working at the brothel were lured into couriering drugs throughout Sydney. So you were sent out here, what, multiple times a week with envelopes that you deliver an hour away in Sydney? On the train, yes. And yes, in this latest version, Cassie did work at a brothel as a sex worker, despite previously denying it point blank. And the inconsistencies kept on coming. She was told by her Colombian prosecutor that her mobile phone, which had the evidence that linked back to the Australian bosses of the drug syndicate back here in Sydney, was inexplicably lost by the Colombian police. It had disappeared. 
Perhaps she and Seven forgot. She told 60 Minutes' Liam Bartlett a very different story back in 2017. The only evidence that can guarantee you walk out that front gate is on a phone that you say you've forgotten the password to. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to remember it, but that's all I can do is try and remember it. Cassie Sainsbury has now done four television interviews since 2017 and produces a new version of events every time. And every time the media are super keen to listen. That's all from us for tonight. There's more on our website, including statements from Amy Skilton, Dementia Australia, and Allegra Spenders, spokesperson. And don't forget Media Bites every Thursday. But for now until next week, goodbye.